Well, today we are opening up to Acts chapter 1 and beginning to walk through this book. And we're going to continue to use the simple acronym of SOAP as kind of a guide to help us walk through Scripture. And so that stands for Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer. So let's begin with the Scripture. In the first three verses of Acts, it says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after through the Holy Spirit he had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And so we're going to call this new journey in Acts the, the proof of Christ continued. The proof of Christ continued. And the reason why is because something we observe, moving on to our second letter in the acronym there, in the text today. So Acts chapter 1 verses 1 through 3, Luke begins by talking about how he has written a former account to Theophilus. So the former account was the Gospel of Luke. And I've already uh, given you the answer on who the author is. That is Luke. Luke, who was the uh, doctor and historian, the traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. He went with Paul on Paul's missionary's journey, uh, journeys, and Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke to this gentleman, Theophilus. And he also then writes kind of part two, um, which is the book of Acts. And I want to show you why uh, I'm calling this, because of the greater context, why I'm calling this study in the book of Acts, the proof of Christ continued. Over in Luke chapter 1, we find the first four verses, and the first four verses tell us the purpose in which Luke wrote the gospel account that bears his name. It says this, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. So apparently, Theophilus had some skepticism, and Luke wrote to him. He consulted eyewitnesses. He talked to ministers of the word that had delivered the message of the gospel to them, that had seen Jesus eyewitness resurrected, after he had uh, died in the grave and then come back to life and shown himself to his disciples. Luke arranged all of that, a narrative, a story, an account of everything that Jesus did, what he taught, and then he also pointed to the fact that it was an orderly account. Luke provides more than any of the other gospel writers the historical details. What's going on in the world around? What Roman governor is ruling? What's going on over here in the the culture or the context or the nation, so to speak. Luke points to all of those types of things. And he writes his Gospel of Luke to Theophilus in order that Theophilus can know the certainty of the proofs of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And this proof continues kind of with part two. Part one, the Gospel of Luke being the proof of who Jesus is. And part two, showing that the kingdom of God and Jesus' work in the disciples and through them in extending the good news of the gospel continues. So it's kind of like part two. There's proof that Christianity and proof that the church of Jesus Christ is real. This is not something fabricated or made up. So back in Acts chapter 1, we continue. The former account was the gospel of Luke that Luke had wrote to Theophilus. And he wrote to him in that gospel of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that Jesus was taken up to when he was ascended into heaven. And then it goes on to say, After he, that's after Christ, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. We see here that the Holy Spirit is playing a key role in Jesus' ministry to his apostles to those disciples that he had walked with and that he appeared to and instructed during the days in which he lived after his resurrection before he ascended into heaven. And Luke even tells us here in our passage that that was a time period of 40 days. 
when Jesus was in his resurrected body, appearing to his people and instructing his apostles. And so we're going to observe that there are primarily uh, several things that the book of Acts as a whole is going to point to. It's going to point to the fact that there were apostles, his disciples, who when he was arrested and then crucified, they ran away and they fled from him. But when he was resurrected, they became eyewitnesses. They were cowardly before, but something has changed in their life, and most of them give their lives for the gospel. All of them end up suffering persecution because they believe in Jesus. And so the evidence is heartily on the side of this being true. We see Luke also say there are many infallible proofs. Skeptics may have questions. This gentleman, Theophilus, back in the first century, it appears, had some questions. Wanted to know the certainty of the things he had been taught. The proof is there. Someone's not a skeptic because of lack of evidence. Skepticism is because of lack of belief. The infallible proof is there, overwhelming proofs that Jesus is who he said he was, the Son of God who died to take upon himself the penalty for the sins of the entire world. Everybody that will turn to him in faith will have forgiveness of their sins. That is the gospel message, and that is verified through numerous accounts and numerous evidences that Jesus lived and walked, he taught, and he lived, and he had lives of individuals transformed. Not only in the healings and the miracles he did, but in the personal transformation of those that were closest to him, going from being cowardly to becoming bold witnesses for him. And so we notice those things, but we also are going to notice three primary themes, threads, if you will, through the book of Acts. And this is hinted at here in our first three verses today, but it's also going to be a theme throughout this entire book as we observe the context. Acts is going to emphasize the Holy Spirit. The person and the ministry of the third person of the Trinity is going to be emphasized throughout the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit leading and guiding the people of God throughout this book. Secondly, the kingdom of God is going to be emphasized in contrast to an earthly kingdom. Jesus talked about in his ministry how he was coming to bring a kingdom that was not observable. It was something that would begin in the heart and the lives of those who would place their faith in him. And so Jesus' kingdom in the book of Acts is going to extend even as other earthly kingdoms are ruling and faltering and failing and, and messed up. Uh, but we're going to see Jesus' kingdom, which is not of this world, continue to grow. It's not dependent on the powers that be in this world. That is a theme in the book of Acts. And another theme is going to be the establishment of the church. Jesus left his apostles and left his followers with the truth and, and with the uh, eyewitness knowledge, the firsthand knowledge that he was resurrected from the grave. And then he was going to fill them with the Holy Spirit so that they could be his witnesses to the ends of the earth, building his kingdom and establishing the new community, the new family of the church. So we see those things for us in the passage today. But how do we apply this? How do we apply both the Gospel of Luke, which is part one, so to speak, and part two of Luke's two-volume work, Acts, how do we apply those and how do we use those in our Christian life? Well, a clear application, first of all, is if we have questions or skepticism about the claims of Christ or the validity of Christianity, the validity of the institution of the church being real and being valid, the place to go with those questions is these particular two books of the Bible that were written for that reason, to give the infallible proof of who Jesus is and that his church truly is the church of the living God. You're not saved because you're a member of some particular denomination. All that matters is do you know Jesus Christ and are you part of his church? Now, you can't live that life alone. There is a calling and there's a pattern we're going to see in Acts for local churches. So I'm not saying there's never any institution. No denomination can save us. But we do need to have a personal relationship with Jesus, and part of growing in that personal walk with him is to be united with other believers, other sinners who have been saved by grace, who are on this journey of living life for the Lord. So we're going to see that. There is the establishment of the church and the growth of his kingdom as the gospel message is proclaimed and people believe. 
So this is a book to turn to if we're skeptical. And also if we encounter someone or we talk to someone we know that is skeptical or a skeptic of the claims of Christ, Christianity, or the church, this is a great place to challenge them. Hey, read this book and really study what it's saying and look at all the proofs that it gives. And then let's come back and let's discuss it. Let's let the Word of God do the work for which God has given it. It's the Word of God that can demolish strongholds, that can correct our thoughts, that can get to discerning the thoughts and the intents of our heart. So, so let's let the Word of God do what God's called it to do and encourage the skeptic to go to these books that the original context is actually to address the skeptic's heart and the skeptic's questions. We also are going to see that there is the clear application that there is a pattern and an invitation for us to follow. Not only is Jesus in this book going to challenge his apostles, and then later on we're going to see the same challenge being embraced by the churches that are established and those that believe and are part of the kingdom, that they are going to have this challenge to live a life filled with the Spirit rather than just doing things in their own understanding. And so we are going to have the challenge as well as believers today to live the same way that the early church did, to choose to live a life submitted and surrendered to the Lord, filled with His Spirit, and on mission for Him, not simply living for whatever else we would want to devote our life to, but rather fully and devotedly placing Jesus on the throne of our life, seeking to be filled with His Spirit, directed by Him, so that we can be a blessing to others. We also are going to see a clear application that the kingdom of God extends. And we are called throughout the New Testament to be citizens of the kingdom of God if we are believers in Jesus Christ. And so we live underneath a different kingship. Our first citizenship is not whatever country we've been born to on this earth, but the fact that we are citizens of the heavenly kingdom of Jesus. And that perspective and that reality changes our worldview in terms of how we live and how we think and, and, and perceive the situations and the circumstances that we encounter in life. And we're going to see that truth also do the same thing for the early church throughout this book as they recognize they are servants and they are citizens of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That changes the way that they look at things when stuff doesn't always go according to plan uh, in this particular book of the Bible. We're also going to see that we are called to be part of a new family. When God saves us, he places us in a new spiritual family, a new community, and that is the church. And there is something about the blessing of fellowship in the body of Christ. You can meet somebody you've never met before, but because you're both believers in Jesus Christ, you have this connection that you, you just can sense between the two of you. Have you ever experienced that, believers listening today? And if not, it is one of the blessings that the Lord has given us. It's the blessing of being part of a family that transcends socioeconomic status, it transcends ethnicity, it transcends race, it transcends all the things that divide us by blood and by birth and by nation all across the world. Rather now we have a spiritual family that we have been born into by the power of God and we are able to walk with one another as children of God. And hey, sometimes there's some family dynamics there that are challenging but it is a new family that we can walk with because the Lord has called us to be one in Christ. And so we're going to see that invitation. That's a clear application as well. Let's pray today as we wrap up looking at these first three verses and uh, observing some things, seeking to apply it in faithfulness with the text. And let's pray what we see here as we end today. Father, we come before you. And Lord, we thank you that you went to the cross on our behalf and you provided all of the evidence and all of the certainty that you are the Son of God, that you are the only way to have forgiveness of sins. And Lord Jesus, that you do have the power to transform our life. Father, you send the gift of your Holy Spirit to empower us and enable us to live for you. Lord, I just ask that today as we are closing the chapter on this first part, this first edition of looking at this book, that you will help us to apply the truth of your word as we continue to walk. Father, as we have perhaps questions in our life or as we encounter skeptics, remind us that this is a place, your word is the place to bring those questions to, 
to bring them to you and to examine the evidence. Is Satan tempting us to disbelieve with a lie and with a deception? Is Satan throwing in our way a lie to believe a half-truth, a partial truth, rather than truly diving in and embracing the truth? Father, thank you for the blessing the truth does not change. Infallible proof remains the same. And help us to rest our faith upon truth and to trust in the truth of who you are and what you have done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.